All right, thank you, Julia, for starting the recording. Welcome back, everybody, to part two of AV preservation. Uh, we're going to just dive right into talking about digitization today, and I'm excited to actually. We're going to start off with like two questions in just a minute. So get ready, you know, mentally to participate either through the chat or by virtually raising your hands, and I will call on people as I see your hand raised. And um, a few reminders, if you are not speaking, please mute your mic so we can reduce background noise. Again, raise your hand to speak if you'd like to unmute. And you can always use the chat to talk with each other throughout or to answer questions or respond to anything that I put out there throughout our session today. And I, again, need to, I want to start my screen share. There we go. Welcome to part two. And then I want to thank again a few people, uh, everybody at the Huna Heritage Foundation, Library and Archives, and especially the executive director, Amelia, who um, has written the National Endowment for the Humanities grant that is making this all happen and um, who is always so great to work with. So thank you again, Amelia, for everything and to the Huna Heritage Foundation as a whole and to the National Endowment for the Humanities for the support for this project. And I also wanted to state thank the folks, especially Julie, who just started the recording at the Alaska State Library Archives and Museums for providing the Zoom support and helping us get the word out about the workshop too. So thank you everybody again. I have another way for you to follow along if you like, and I'm going to put a link in the chat to the Google Drive where, is you, can, where you can download um, two handouts for today. You can download the PDF of the slides again to follow along that way. And then also, um, no surprise, the handout that says part two is the one that we'll need for today. So I'm just going to take a second to also put those in the chat. There's the slides and there's the AV action plan that you can use if you'd like. And what this is, is just basically a virtual sheet of paper or an actual sheet of paper to um, do some brainstorming on the front and then on the back some prioritization. So on the front, you can jot down as you think of ideas that you could use to take action on AV preservation at your institution. Um, like maybe you can even use an idea from yesterday, like start an inventory, um, other action items that you could act upon after the session, whether it's tomorrow or a year from now. Any kind of time span you want to think about is fine. And then on the back side, we're going to wrap up with that today. And you can take some time to kind of prioritize things you could do now, things you could do later, things you don't know how to do. So for now, on the front of this sheet, it's about just brainstorming some ideas like collections inventory, like um, getting some new film cans, things like that. You can start drawing those down here. Or you can just listen, follow along however you want, take notes, however you want to do it. This is just one option if you want that little bit of structure. All right, so housekeeping stuff out of the way, let's talk about digitization. We talked all about identifying formats yesterday. Uh, we're moving away from that towards what you can do, some action steps you can take towards preserving AV collections. I'm going to go ahead and video off again to make sure my internet doesn't uh, do anything that will interrupt us. So I'm going to video off, but then I immediately have a question for you all which is, uh, why is digitization a good strategy for long-term preservation of AV collections? And go ahead and think about it and then type in the chat or raise your hand and I'll, I'll look for any virtual hands raised uh, for you to unmute and answer it verbally if you like to. So what are some reasons here? There's a bunch of them, but what are some reasons that AV is, or digitization is a good strategy for AV preservation? Yeah, I love that using that word from yesterday, degradescence, that combination of degradation and obsolescence. What else? With a good digital preservation system, you can migrate at least formats easily. Yep, especially when old formats become obsolete. Lots of great answers here. I'm going to keep reading them out. It allows for easy reformatting as needed, but also allows to share and share content in a variety of ways, including print formats, allows material to be preserved on multiple platforms. These are such great reasons. 
AV is very sensitive and no matter what, they will degrade to the point you can't use them. Mm -hmm. Can widely share, yep. And metadata is easy to pair with a file. That's a great one. That's not one that has come up before when I've asked this question. So uh, you get that. And then, yeah, Brett, so true. Nothing lasts forever. Digitization provides another way to preserve, and that's not affected by um, certain degradation vectors. Yeah, but you're totally onto it that nothing lasts forever. The digital doesn't last forever. It's just a different kind of management strategy that's a little bit uh, more sustainable long term. All right, I'll give it like 10 more seconds in case anybody's typing to get your answer in there. Um, but these are exactly the reasons that digitization is a great strategy for long term preservation of AV collections. So I don't need to convince you all, you're all already on board. Digitization is a great strategy for the preservation of these collections. But then we have another question because usually you can't digitize everything. Sometimes you can, maybe you've got like just a handful of films or a few uh, videotapes and the rest of your collections is photos. But if you've got a large collection of AV or even a small collection and you need to choose what to digitize first, you need to make some choices. So what factors um, are or will be important to your institution in choosing which collections or items to digitize first or which to digitize period and which won't be digitized um, so i'll give you some examples you might consider condition obsolescence uniqueness things like that um, but go ahead and put in the chat, or I will look out for hands as well. What factors are you going to consider, or do you already consider? And I'll stop talking to give you a chance to type. I see a few a few factors to consider. We have availability or uniqueness. Yeah, one example of that is if you have like a VHS that is a um, recording of a TV broadcast that is like definitely preserved elsewhere. It's probably not going to be your first priority. We've got most fragile first. Most fragile can be in there. Um, we're going to take a look at an example of a matrix because it's often about like the interplay of all the factors, but most fragile comes in there. The one thing to add some more nuance to that is like maybe it's the most fragile, but it's also something that there's like 20 other copies of. So the combination of those two is a good one. Materials that have already started to degrade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, rights, that's a great one to consider. Some of the advantage could be, um, I'm just gonna read this because I'm trying to reward it and that's not that's silly. So sometimes we consider whether some of the advantages of digital files more easily serving it up to the public being one of those wouldn't be gained anyway due to rights restrictions. So if you can't stream it anyways, uh, it may or may not be a priority high risk first or if the reels are loaned yeah that's another great one that i don't actually have on my list i don't think on the next slide of uh, if you are working with community members who are um, lending you materials to digitize and then taking back the materials that would lead to a different priority decision as well and one more here anything in danger because of limited space or uh may be dangerous like nitrate foam because they degrade yeah sometimes a batch approach is done um and you were you were close on you it's not a uh, nitrate it's cellulose so don't worry um and melissa yeah that is an approach like batching if you have like a collection of cassette tapes sending those out uh, as a batch instead of like three cassette tapes five vhs for efficiency
Yep, and one more um, factor to consider that Chloe adds is taking into consideration the content and prioritizing digitizing images that depict communities that have been historically erased or ignored or marginalized. Yeah, you all have added more than I had here on my slide of examples. So condition came up, obsolescence, intellectual property, whether it can be made available, um, use whether somebody has requested to use it is sometimes a way that people prioritize uh, availability elsewhere or uniqueness the artifactual value less for av we'll just set that one aside uh, the value of the content institutional policies can guide this as well and cultural sensitivities can guide what you prioritize as well so this is often not like a one person decision. So this is my last question for you for a little bit, and then I'll give you a break on the questions. But at your institution, who needs to participate in the decision making process? And I ask this because sometimes we'll get ideas from each other around who you might also need to bring in to um, help make decisions, either to set a policy to then follow or to um, make decisions kind of on a collections by collections basis. Who needs to participate in that process? Or who already does participate in that process is another way to ask it if you already have this set up. Oh, I see one good example in the chat, the archivist on our department head. I'm going to mute for a minute just to let you all type. I see some more good answers coming in. All right, two more examples in the chat. Collective staff process with board input, staff and advisory board with help from local museum curators, person or group who advertises the availability to the public, have an AV expert, great, who's excellent at understanding the risk of loss. This is a really great example that Karen's gotten here too of uh, based on your collections policy, it's possible that if the department and executive director disagree, then the collections committee may need to participate to settle it. And the collections committee has two board members. Yeah, so this is, these are all great. I'm glad you all shared these because everybody had a slightly different one, which is often how it is, uh, that there's not like one role in an institution who makes these decisions or one people or one person who should be making this decision over others. So these collaborative approaches uh, that it sounds like you all have established, including having a policy that you can refer to, is a, a great way to make these decisions. However you make the decision, that can be useful to document how you're doing it. So Karen's example provides, uh, or Karen provides a good example that you have a collections policy which states even what to do if there's a disagreement. And that documentation helps you both now to make decisions um, and in the future to communicate how decisions were made. So like I said, um, there are a number of different factors and one doesn't necessarily outweigh another. So Brett mentioned um, the most deteriorated, used a different word, I think, but the most deteriorated things first. And, um, and I said that like it's in balance with other things. So here's an example of a way that if you wanted, you can work on balancing all of those factors that go into making a decision. It's a matrix that you can use to, as an example, to establish your own decision-making matrix if you wanted to approach it in that way. So this is called a project proposal evaluation rubric. It doesn't have to be as formal sounding as this, but the basic principle is that you have um, some factors that you use to make your decision, and then you weight them differently. So in this example, um, the copyright status is weighted as a four um, 
which I think for their matrix means like that is lower importance. And then the higher importance are things like relation to teaching and research priorities. So that's going to be something that will be a deal breaker. Basically, if it doesn't relate to teaching and research priorities, it's not going to be a priority for digitization. So you could consider making a matrix like this or a simpler policy that says like we prioritize digitizing materials that relate to teaching and research priorities. However you do it, I would say document it and communicate it so it's clear as to why and how decisions are being made. So once you've figured out what you're going to digitize, the next thing to figure out is the how you're going to digitize. And there are two ways that you could approach this digitizing it in house, meaning having the equipment to play back the materials digitization software and hardware to capture it and storage all in house operated owned by your institution. You can also outsource, send your materials off to a vendor. They do everything, send them back to you with some digital files. And you can combine the two as well and do some formats in house, outsource some. A lot of institutions take that route. I want to talk about some of the pros and cons of doing the work in house versus outsourcing it, but I'd love to have your additions to this. These aren't comprehensive pros and cons. There are other ones um, that I may have missed or just from your perspective, what other pros and cons are. So I'm going to start with the pros or benefits of, in of digitizing in-house, but please add others as you have them. So some positives of digitizing collections in-house include that you can build skills among staff or volunteers who, who are doing the digitization work. So they may, um, they may have some experience with audio equipment, but want to learn about new types of equipment or have no experience and want to learn how, and you can build some skills that way. You also limit the risks that are associated with transporting the collections physically to a different place, maybe across the country even. So you limit any risks associated with that because you're keeping them in-house. And when you outsource, you usually have to not be able to access collections for months even at a time and when you do it in-house you can make collections available throughout the process any other benefits of in-house digitization one other as you're thinking that still that sometimes comes up is um it's a different sort of budget allocation than outsourcing. So I hesitate to say that it's less or more expensive, but it's different. It requires a lot of staff time, equipment, software, and hardware. Sometimes institutions have budgets for that and don't have budgets for paying external vendors. So it's just a different kind of budgeting. I'm gonna pause for about a minute um, to give you a chance to think any other in-house pros that you would add to this list. great reasons in the chat I'm gonna let you all catch up on them i'm gonna just highlight a few um some content might not be appropriate to share beyond the community uh you can also be processing at the same time like creating metadata 
and building up skills. So Freya, I think you're adding to that first bullet point to not only skills within your institution, but skills in your local area and knowledge in your local area. And I see, I think I see a hand raised. Uh, Melissa, go ahead and unmute and add what you're thinking. Yes, yes, that is me. Um, so uh, my background is mainly public libraries and uh, maybe this is a question for later, but um, we, as a public library, I wouldn't imagine that they, that uh, that you know the Fairbanks Public Library or maybe another public library would be the one to do the in-house processing. Um, it, how do the other folks on here feel about receiving materials from other, um, you know, like a public library if we would happen to have something unique? Good question. Is there a sharing now, network already in place, I guess? And and Freya mentioned, um, you know, having more in-state equipment. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm going to let folks in the chat answer it or raise your hand if you want to verbally answer it. Go for it, Freya. Um, so I think probably um, one of the places M Melissa might have been talking about might have been the State Library, um, although certainly the University um, in Fairbanks and Anchorage um, have, have capability as well. Um, but um, we have so much backlog and there are often other and and are short staffed and so and there are also often other issues so we um don't as a general rule take um take work from other organizations but that is not a hard and fast rule and so it it um it really depends on sort of what it is and um and what the situation is um in many cases sending something out to a commercial vendor might um might be the best option but um but that's something that we can discuss on a case by case basis Sure, thanks, Freya. And it, it, this is Melissa again. Uh, I I wouldn't expect that it happens all that often that a public library would already have something that a university or, or you know the state library would not. Um, I I try to um, keep the mantra that a public library is not an archive. Our our job as a public library is to you know keep some of those keep keep the current material rotating. Um, but I feel like that's a little different in Alaska because we just have so many treasures and um, yeah, and just not, um, I just wanna, you know, we wanna preserve those. So anyway, um, thanks and uh, definitely a case by case basis, um, but just, um, yeah, curious too, if there's any, is there a place, maybe it's just the ACLA listserv, um, or something along those lines uh, where people would resource share in that way of digital preservation and digitization. Well, I, I would encourage you, I didn't want to, I didn't mean to be discouraging either. So I would encourage you or anybody to contact us um, uh, if you have something. And I, and I do think that in Alaska, um, partly because we're, um, so geographically separated. Um, there are a lot of public libraries that may not have a lot of content, but have unique, some unique content. And, um, and so I think that's something that's important to keep an eye out. Um, there are people who are hesitant to have things leave their community. And um, so that's, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Are most folks here on the um, Alaska Library Association listserv? Is there a is there an archive listserv in the state? Great question. I don't see anybody responding in the chat with an archive listserv. Oh, there it is. There is an archive when it seems.
Hi, I want to, this is Lorraine in, in Kodiak uh, as a public library. We, um, I think it was Melissa said, you know, we don't want to be at just a storehouse. We want to share things um, with our communities, but there are times I appreciate somebody letting me know there's something about Kodiak that might be of interest in our collection. And, and I know I'm not just talking um, audio visual materials, but any material, because in addition to our museums, we are a repository for a, for a lot of print documents where the museum may not have print documents. We do like the Harriman expedition or uh, books from the Russian America company and things like that, that may need to be digitized. But if I knew somebody in Fairbanks had some journal from uh, Captain Grigory Shelikov and they wanted to bring it to Kodiak that we would welcome that. And I know that in the, a group of us, which Julie can tell me if I've got the right name, the Der Lead Group. It's the director's leadership group in um, as a part, actually, I guess it's a part of ACLA, but anyway, there's a, a lot of sharing that goes on there as well. And so if I had something for Fairbanks, I'd be happy to offer it up because space is an issue and it doesn't speak to our collection policy or Kodiak, I guess is the point, but thank you. Thanks, Lorraine, and thank you everybody for adding these local resources and ways to keep connected afterwards too. I appreciate that. Okay, so we're gonna get back to um, the other side of in-house digitization, which is the cons, and I'll list some here, but please um, add others as you think of them too. Some of the downsides of digitizing in-house include equipment can be really expensive, um, both to acquire and to maintain. So we talked about so many different formats yesterday to try to do all of those formats in-house, you need a player for all of them. So that can be a downside. Those players also require space. They also require staff to operate them. Um, and you might not have expertise in-house to be able to digitize a particular format or have the um, time to be able to cultivate that expertise internally. Sometimes depending, uh, the implementation timeline can be longer if you need to kind of like upscale and acquire equipment and all of that, as opposed to working with a vendor who's got it ready to go. Um, that totally depends on on both options, but it's just it's another factor to think about. Yeah, I see for as we have a whole room with old equipment and the vendors that you a commercial vendor will have like several rooms with so much equipment it's wild. I'm going to pause for another. 30 seconds or so if you've got any other cons to add in the chat or raise your hand. All right, keep adding them if you think of them. Let's talk about some of the benefits of outsourcing. So with outsourcing, and I'm gonna, um, based on Julie's question yesterday, thank you for asking that. I added a list of some vendors, but I'm really glad that you all are including some local info because my expertise tends to be on the Eastern side of the country where I am. So um, outsourcing means working with a commercial vendor or even just locally with a university or other service provider who can um, help you out. So meaning they already have the setup, they have the expertise, all of that. With outsourcing, you can usually do a larger volume in a shorter amount of time. The costs can be more predictable. So again, it's just like a different budget situation where you upfront will have a quote from the vendor if any straying from that quote is going to happen, you'll have a conversation, but it's pretty predictable because you've made an agreement. The vendor will also have experience and expertise in a wide range of formats and also in troubleshooting a wide range of formats. There may also be additional services available like generating metadata um, and they will also do things like conservation work like um, baking tapes or other repairs that need to be done. It can be a smaller initial investment as well, so you're not paying for the um, equipment or the upkeep. On the downsides, it 
happens outside of your institution. So you do have to transport materials to a different place, uh, which adds cost and risk. You have less physical control over the artifacts. It requires in-house work, which is less of a con and more of just a fact that I like to remind people of, that even if you are outsourcing, you will need to do some preparation and quality control. And that takes some in-house staff time as well. So I went for the pros and cons all at once for outsourcing. What other pros and cons um, have you all experienced with outsourcing? I'm going to again going to mute myself for, to give you a chance to type or raise your hand. And Freya, that's an interesting comment about um, there's a tech support shortage in Alaska, it seems like. Oh, that's an interesting new con that I've not heard of before, um, but totally makes sense. You had unique content go missing because your vendor outsourced out of country right before COVID. So one of the tips I'm going to say is um, ask a lot of questions of your vendor, and I never would have thought of that one. Um, well, you couldn't ask them, is a global pandemic going to happen? But you could ask them, do you subcontract and will our collections be shipped elsewhere? Yeah, the down, downside is not having materials available for use while they're out at a vendor. And Amelia adds, if you have a small amount of one format, it doesn't make sense to purchase it. Another, another great point. Yeah, but you have a tape converter because it's easy to use and you have a lot of tapes that come through. Great example of like a hybrid approach too, where you might digitize um, audio tapes because they're easy, easy to get a hold of a recorder, easy to get a, re a new recorder if it breaks, all of that. Uh, cassette tapes are a great example of one to digitize in-house and then outsource something like a Umatic where you have like five of them or something. Great example. Yeah, and I see a good question. Do they ensure the material they receive? Yes, they should. Um, and if they say no, you should ask a lot more questions. So that's a question to ask the vendor. How do they ensure the material they receive? And um, from my knowledge, they usually have like some sort of fine arts coverage because these are unique materials that they're needing to ensure. Uh, and your insurance coverage might also cover the materials while they're outside of your facility. So if you have um, an insurance agent or somebody who works in risk management, if you're at like a university that you're able to ask about your own coverage, then also, that might be an option because there's the in transport as well. So you wanna know who's insuring the collections while they're with the vendor and while they're being transported. Great question. And another good point, yes, vendors sometimes don't meet deadlines. So definitely something to uh, consider and you've asked for materials back because they didn't digitize it for over a year. And one more great con. Thanks, Brett, for um, adding. If you were unsure of the content, you might end up paying for something that's pretty useless. Totally can happen. Uh, one thing that you can do for that, though, is sometimes a vendor will like listen to a few seconds of it um, to assess it, especially if you don't have the equipment to play it back in house. So you don't always have to like commit to digitizing it if you don't know what's on it. There could be another option for just like getting some feedback from the vendor on what what is on the tape, if, if anything, especially if you're like, there could be nothing on this, then you'd want to make sure there's something before you digitize. Great. Thank you all for adding so much to the reasons that I had um, and 
I want to hear a little bit more from you. What approaches are you considering? And tell us a little bit about why. And again, you can use the chat or raise your hand. And Amelia already gave one good example of this. You're doing in-house for cassettes because it's an easy tool to use and you have a lot of tapes. I forgot to add, I don't know is also a totally valid answer here. <laughs> Yes, thank you for, for adding that, that you use a vendor for grant funded projects because in-house staff are so busy and grant funded projects also have a pretty specific timeline where you have to spend that money. So um, working with the vendor, I guess based on what we were saying earlier, it can go either way, but um, it often gives you a, a more concrete timeline where you don't have to worry about like equipment breaking or something. Oh, that's a super great example, Karen, using your local radio station to help digitize your audio cassettes. Thanks for adding that as another example of a local resource. And I would I would push back on saying it's not the most archival way of doing it, because if they have the software and the hardware and you use the right specifications, that sounds great. And digitizing it is still like better than not digitizing it. Um, you know, I'm sure you all have heard the saying, perfect is the enemy of the good. I think that comes up a lot in archives and in AV digitization too, where um, work is stalled or we hesitate because we wanna get it totally perfect. Um, but given that it's going to degrade and possibly be less and less accessible over time, you might consider that as well. Yeah, that's another good point that Freya adds to that free means you can do more other things. Cool, thanks again for adding those examples. Um, I wanted to give you a few outsourcing quick tips if you do go the vendor route, and um, I'm happy to answer more questions about this too. But a few quick tips is one, if you can work with a vendor. So if you're working with like a commercial vendor, work with a vendor who has experience with cultural heritage collections over someone who has experience with like business records or um, things that aren't really meant to last a long time. Again, I think that approach that you've mentioned, um, Karen, is great. Well, it might seem like they don't have cultural heritage experience. Um, I think people at a radio station have a ton of audio expertise, so you're getting that. Um, but if you have a choice between like a vendor who is like pushing um, business records digitization versus someone who's worked with cultural heritage, it can be easier to communicate. Um, the standards that you're looking for, and they will know more about standards in the field too. So that's that's what that bullet point is about. Keep it in mind that you will need time to prepare the collections, to be shipped, to create some metadata to go to the vendor, to um, specify how you want them, to, what specifications you want them to use to digitize to, and then when they come back, that you'll also need to dedicate some time to doing some quality control, to making sure that everything is as you expected. Make sure to talk about your deadlines with a vendor. Uh, if you don't have a specific deadline, your project could get pushed because other projects do have a specific deadline. So give a specific deadline. Um, and if you are on a grant project, make sure that they know that because you will need to invoice them before the end of that project and just communicating about that upfront can be helpful. And then, Ask them a lot of questions. Um, vendors will often have resources to help you pack the collections, meaning like just a guide on how to pack the particular format they're trying to safely pack. Um, if you're not sure about what specifications you want them to use, we're gonna talk about 
specifications shortly. But if you're not sure, you can always ask them, like, what do you recommend for this format? That's another time where it's helpful to have uh, cultural heritage expertise. And you should be able to ask them, like, anything else that you're not sure about. I just want to encourage that, like, they should be able to answer your questions. And if you want to ask them about insurance, you should ask them about that, um, about anything that you are just like unclear on. Ask them a lot of questions. Some examples of vendors I've listed here. Um, we don't have an affiliation with these vendors. Um, or I don't have an affiliation with these vendors, but they are ones that are generally trusted in the cultural heritage fields and that either I've worked with or um, have a good kind of reputation. And these, again, as I said, my expertise, sad to say, mostly East uh, Preserve South is in uh, Atlanta or Georgia. Media Preserve is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and George Blood Audio Video is in uh philadelphia pennsylvania color lab is in maryland and av geeks is down the street from me in raleigh north carolina so these are some examples but um let's take another second to see if anybody has any other resources so karen mentioned a radio station other uh, vendors service providers or resources that you've used locally i think i heard a university or two mentioned somebody wants to put that in the chat um, and other examples so i'm going to mute for you to brainstorm slash in the chat slash raise your hand yes there are some good ones in california because of the film industry thanks for um looking that up too I've linked to all of these in the slides. So if you've got the PDF or you download those Google slides, you'll have links to them as well. And then maybe we'll see some others come up in the chat. Please keep adding them there. If you've gotten any other names or places you wanna share, I'm keeping an eye on the clock and wanna make sure we get into digitization preparations. I'm gonna keep going, but go ahead and keep chatting. So I mentioned you'll need time for preparing collections to digitize and for QC. Let's talk about digitization preparation. Some of the steps that might be involved include separating out moldy items, either for cleaning in-house or so the vendor doesn't get a box that has both moldy and not moldy items. It's nice if you can separate those out so mold's not spreading and so that anybody handling them gets that warning. You want to make sure labels will not be lost or separated from their original materials. Um, if you can visualize, yesterday I showed one example of a box of reel-to-reel -reel tapes where some of the boxes were a little bit broken. If you're going to ship that box, you might want to make sure um, by putting it in a sleeve or another box um, or making a photocopy, just making sure that any labels won't be lost or detached and then unclear where they came from. Adhesives fail over time, and that's usually what's happening. If you are digitizing cassette formats, remember we looked at those little record mechanisms yesterday where you can pop them out or break them or whatever needs to happen so that you can no longer record over that item. Go ahead and do that as a part of your preparation for digitization. Collections then need to be packed appropriately. So usually that means packing them in a box and adding some foam or some um, paper or other or bubble wrap or other insulating materials around that box and then inside of another box. So box within a box approach is usually good to insulate them both from changes in temperature and relative humidity and any dropping that happens. And then rehouse items if necessary, based on the what we talked about yesterday, if that original housing is totally broken and the item original item needs protection or if the original item is moldy. 
Here's another, uh, just an, another quick reminder of where that record mechanism is on a cassette tape and then on a U-Matic. It's also on all other cassette formats. And um, this resource will help from the preservation assessment program will help you find it on any format. If you're working with a vendor or if you're digitizing in-house and have a lot of expertise in it, repairing or preparing things, the vendor or in-house might also repair splices that were done poorly initially. So if two audio tapes were, if it was broken and then repaired or two tapes were spliced together, those splices might be repaired by the vendor. They will also usually clean materials that are moldy and that um, have palmitic acid on them. And if you are digitizing records and they look like this, send them to the vendor that way because it's best if they're cleaned right before they're digitized. They might clean off any dirt or grime as well. So if you see, if you are getting a quote and you see time built in for this, it makes sense. It's good if you can give as much information about the condition as possible so they know in advance that they're gonna need to build in some time for this. They might also build in some time for baking tapes like we talked about just briefly yesterday to address sticky shed syndrome. If a tape is, has, is, or is exhibiting sticky shed syndrome, and they go ahead and put it on the playback equipment, um, it will shed and stick um, to that recording equipment. And you won't get as good as a, of a playback and you might experience some damage as you would post baking. And some vendors will also just store them in their um, storage vault that generally have very good temperature and relative humidity control and that can make it playable as well. In addition to that, um, I didn't include a screenshot here, but you often will have to complete a spreadsheet that has some basic metadata about the item that you're sending. So it might have um, title, a unique identifier, a description, and some other basic metadata that you'll need to get the vendor. But you can also think of it as just like a packing list. When you send something, you want to send a list of what's in that box so that you make sure you get that list back. So also save a copy of it. And that's a process that a vendor should usually walk you through. If they uh, have been digitizing for other institutions, they should have a spreadsheet to send you or be able to ask you for exactly what metadata they need from you. So we're moving now into the actual like converting an analog signal to a digital signal part, audio and video capture. In general, use best practices for preservation alongside what your internal capabilities are related to staffing, funding, and storage in conjunction with what platforms you're using for access and what the source material is to do what it says on the left. Establish and document internal guidelines to either follow or guide vendor specifications. So either follow in-house or to guide vendor specifications. Um, and we're going to look at like best practices for preservation, um, but also consider like what internal capabilities you have. Meaning, especially for video, if you can't digitized to what is like quote unquote preservation standard, um, that can be okay. I just want to be upfront with that. Generally to capture an analog signal into a digital or to go from one digital format to another, you'll need some playback equipment. And it's great if you have expertise on that equipment or if you need to grow expertise, that can happen as well. Um, but expertise is required to operate the equipment. The equipment should also be cleaned, especially if you're purchasing it. Um, I mean, you will be purchasing it used. Um, it may have been cleaned already, but if not, make sure that the equipment is clean before you run anything through it. That equipment should ideally also be calibrated so that you're getting the most or the closest to the original capture as you can. 
On the left, this image that we're seeing is an example of a video digitization station at uh, UNC Chapel Hill Special Collections Library. And they have, as you can see, many different pieces of video playback equipment. And so they're equipped to uh, digitize a wide array of video in-house. You might have just like one of these players. Um, what you might also notice is that like, this doesn't look like any VHS player I had at home. Uh, maybe the top left one kind of does, but the reason for that is that some of it is like professional grade playback equipment, which means you might get a better capture than you would from just, you know, the VCR that you might be familiar with from like when it was rolled into the classroom um, or when you were watching whatever in the 90s. So basic capture things needed include playback equipment, expertise with it, um, clean that equipment, and we'll talk about calibration a bit more. Capture guidelines for audio, luckily, super easy. Video, well, not as easy. So for audio, um, translating analog to digital, the resolution and bit depth that are recommended for preservation quality capture are 96 kilohertz and 24 bits. Uh, that is a setting that you can change when you're doing that capture. So you'll be going from, if you're going from analog to digital, this is the best um, specifications to use. If you're going digital to digital, you just need to use whatever it started with. You don't need to go higher because you won't get more out of it. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about what, what these two things mean. Uh, but just wanted to start up front with like guidelines for audio, super straightforward guidelines for video depend on the original format. This is a resource that I find particularly easy to follow for guidelines, um, but there are others that you can use from like federal agencies, digitization guidelines initiatives or FAGI or the National Archives. This one comes from the American Library Association and they give you like, what is the original format and then what resolution and bit depth would be good for a preservation level capture. So let's now just drill into audio a little bit more. So audio capture, you're gonna be starting with a format like a cassette, open real or real real audio, um, mini disc, something like that. So you start with your playback device. And then what that ideally goes into is an analog to digital converter. Your machine or computer might have a built-in analog to digital converter, an external one, typically gives you a better quality conversion of that analog signal to a digital signal. It's something that you can buy um, from wherever you're buying other electronic components. You can Google analog to digital converter, but I'm also going to give you a resource to find uh, specific recommendations. So you go from playback, analog to digital or AD converter, into a computer and then onto storage. Ignore the storage option that says CD or DVD because it's not a great one anymore um, and go to external hard drives or um, a server or cloud storage. If you're thinking, I have no idea where to buy an AD converter, this is a good place to go. It is a crowdsourced resource um, that is maintained by Ashley Bluer, who is an AV preservation specialist. And she maintains this documentation on a minimum viable station for digitization. And throughout it, you'll find resources for specific recommendations for equipment and also just like what you need to set up a digitization capture station. The categories that are included in this resource include a computer, analog to digital converter, time-based corrector, food dehydrators for, quote, baking or just drying tapes, um, video decks, so that, that's for video, obviously, cables, and storage recommendations for digital storage. And then also, lastly, software for capture for disk imaging if you're going digital to digital, packaging files, quality control, and generating and embedding metadata. 
So I highly recommend this resource if you're trying to set up any digitization in-house, um, or even if you're just trying to buy some new equipment for digitization in-house. Another resource I wanted to point you to, um, Julie and I were chatting beforehand, and I said I often end up at Sustainable Heritage Network for um, resources to recommend, and here is one example of that right here. So this is a video that walks you through digitizing audio with Audacity, which is one um, free software. There may be others now. There was a big controversy with Audacity a few years ago. Um, there may be other audio, free audio software out there, but this can at least give you a video overview of like a process of digitizing with Audacity. So another resource for you to just like dive into if you want to, um, if you are thinking about digitizing in-house. And even if you are outsourcing, it can be helpful to know a bit more about the process so you can know what to expect or like what's happening on the other end. It's not, it doesn't have to be a mystery. I'm going to go backwards with these two slides and go here first. So I mentioned that resolution in bit depth for audio should be 96 kilohertz, 24 bits. And what does that actually mean? Don't be intimidated by these waves. We're not going to do any math. Um, they're just to illustrate that uh, higher sample rate means you get a better version of the original sound. So this gray line that we're looking at on the top row where it says A, that's the original audio analog sound wave. If we get a sample of that just occasionally and the sample is designated with that white box, if we sample it, you know, every once in a while and then try to recreate that original analog wave digitally, we get this purple wave that doesn't really look a lot like the original one. If we sample it more frequently, we can recreate that wave better. So you, with a higher sample rate, you get closer to what the original sounded like. You can think of it as like uh, connect the dots. If you have only two dots to connect, uh, you're not going to get an image. If you have 200 dots to connect, you can connect them and get a picture. So it's a little bit like that. Um, and then, so the resolution is like how many samples there are. And then the bit depth is how many options there are for each of those samples. So how many different numbers could this, or how many different values could this one box be? There's more options for it with a higher bit depth. So 9624 is what gets you a wide enough range to rep faithfully represent an original uh, analog sound wave. Higher resolution does also get you higher, bigger file sizes. This is one calculator that you can use. This link will download an Excel file directly. Um, there's also one from Sustainable Heritage Network. If you search within their resources for um, audio file size calculator, you'll get something similar. This can give you an estimate of how much storage you need to plan for, um, depending on the, or based on how you're digitizing. In addition to those specifications around bit depth and resolution, another choice that you'll need to make is around um, file format. Again, so nice with audio, straightforward, general agreement in the field, broadcast wave is a good format for audio preservation. It's a wave file .wav that allows for a little extra embedded metadata in it, so it um, can describe itself as a file a little bit better. So broadcast wave is a good file format for access copy. MV3 is a good one because it's smaller, can be compressed, and streamable. 
And to just to clarify a bit more what I mean by preservation master and access copy, you might be familiar with this from other digitization projects or from microfilm projects even, your preservation file is the largest file, it's uncompressed or the least compressed of all the versions. And then the access copy is what you could make available online if you have the rights to make it available online for streaming it's more compressed and it's not the best replication of the original but it's totally usable for access purposes you might have an in between that's a larger file that you use to edit or create derivatives from so this can look like a uh, big old folder, uh, not huge, a lot of these files are small, but if you get a deliverable from a vendor, um, you might expect to see a few different folders in that deliverable package where there's an oral history project in there, you'll have a condition report, and then access files that are labeled uniquely, and a checksum for those access files. We're not going to go into that today, um, but I wanted to just show an example of like what a deliverable package can look like. And you can also work with the vendor usually on capturing images of the original format if you want to make sure that uh, the user understands like with the or user has access to the information that's on the original case or the original um, metadata that was written on the box you can usually work with the vendor to digitize those original materials too thanks brett for adding that comment about audacity that it's user friendly good to know that um, from your experience self-teaching it was Okay, video is more complicated, but you start in the same basic place with a playback equipment that goes into an AD converter, analog to digital converter, and then goes into a computer. The other components that you might have include a monitor to be able to watch the video as it's being digitized, uh, and a monitor to be able to listen to the audio as it's being digitized. So with audio 96, 24 broadcast wave, you can remember those things and be pretty set. With video, it just totally depends on the source material. Um, so an analog NTSC video, meaning not one of the digital formats we work looked at, and NTSC meaning the North American standard for encoding video. PAL was the European standard for encoding video. Um, if they're not like a collection, if it's not like a collection from a different part of the world, then it will likely be NTSC. And how can you find that out? If you're working with a vendor, you could ask them. Um, if you aren't sure, you could even just like do a Google search for that particular format and find more about it, and you should be able to find more info. And then there is resolution um, with two dimensions because you have a length and a width for the video and it gives you the resolution for both dimensions and then there are also some notes so we're today we're not going to like dissect this for every format i'm going to link you to this resource and you can use it to find the recommendations for whatever format you're using if it's a digital video file you want to just keep what it had originally and not change it if you want to really nerd out about this, you um, can check out these capture guidelines that give you like every detail or every setting you could possibly manage for video if you're going to do it in house um, or for communicating with a vendor. So here are some examples of, or here's one example of every specification that they give in this document as a best practice for digitization for preservation for a specific video format. And again, we're not going to like pick this apart right now, um, more as like a resource if you're going to be doing AV or video digitization in house, you can refer back. Video files are big, they get big fast, so they can be compressed. Um, you will see in guidelines for video digitization best practices uncompressed 10 bit video that is going to be a big file. Um, and if you can store it, that's great. If you can't, choosing a um, lossless compression algorithm for the audio and 
um, compressing video in lossless compression as well, will at least help you not completely lose material. So if it's lossless, it is able to be recreated as the original when you uncompress it. If it's lossy, that means it's permanently tossing out data to make the file smaller. You can ignore for now some of these lists of files. I'm going to kind of talk about codecs for a second and then I'll just clarify. These are some examples of like different types of um, uncompressed, lossless, and lossy compression. Videos have these old, whole other fun thing called codecs um, that are used to encode and decode video. And you might have experienced this as a user if you've tried to open a video file and it says you don't have the right codec. That means that you don't have the right information to decode this video based on the way that it was encoded to be compressed. Um, it, so you have options here. It's like too many options. It's a wealth of options that becomes a lot. And it, again, for this, I'm going to point you to a resource from an organization called AVP, who has also, side note, has some really useful free tools for metadata quality control and for fixity checking. So AVP is the organization. And they have also this resource on codecs and wrappers. So those are two places where you need to make a decision of what codec will work for your institution and what wrapper will work for your institution as well. Um, and they make recommendations for codec selection in this resource. So if you're trying to choose a codec, uh, two things. Take a look at this resource, but then also if you're working with a vendor, you can talk to them about what they would recommend based on your institution as well. So we're going to move right on in to the last section of our session today, which is digital preservation, because now you've got digital files and that's great, but now you got to preserve those digital files. So digital preservation here, when I say that, what I mean is preserving digital files. And I like this definition from the American Library Association that says digital preservation combines policies, strategies, and actions to ensure access to reformatted, so what we've been talking about, uh, reformatted like real to real to digital and born digital content, which might be like an MP3 that somebody sent to you, regardless of the challenges of media failure, like a CD breaking and technological change, like CDs being obsolete. The goal of digital preservation is the accurate rendering of authenticated content over time or said another way, you can access it in the future and you're sure it hasn't changed. Digital preservation, again, I think that folks can get stuck in the perfect is the enemy of the good loop here where it either has to be perfect or nothing at all, but it's more of a spectrum. You can do some essential parts of digital preservation that are reasonable, even with limited resources or expertise. And then you can continue to build towards or think towards optimal uh, digital preservation, meaning more reasonable get with ample resources and would be more reliable for long-term preservation, probably. If you're looking for a framework for digital preservation, my personal favorite, I think it's super um, easy to understand and makes a lot of sense. It's from the Sustainable Heritage Network Digital Stewardship Curriculum. And their framework is get it, check it, save it, share it. That's the whole framework. There's a lot more detail under each one, but it is a lot of what digital preservation is. You get an item, which in this case might be digitizing it. You check it continually, you save it, so you make sure it is uh, available in the future, and then you share it, importantly. And I want to give you two essential. So I'm going to go back for a second on the essential side over here and give you two suggestions for what can be in that essential category. Um, and as you, if you're already past the essential and you're looking for more, I definitely say check out the Sustainable Heritage Network. But if you're thinking like, we just need to do the essential right now, make multiple copies and have at least one in a different place from the others. 
those are some very essential things to do if you're not already. If you're already, you're already doing a little bit of digital preservation, making sure that the item is available in the future by protecting it through having multiple copies of it and one of those copies being in a different place so it's safe from any disaster that affects your physical location. Here's another um, question that I like to ask because it also can sometimes illuminate regional or local resources for digital preservation or different approaches that people have taken. So how will you or how do you store digitized audiovisual materials at your institution? And you don't have to be perfect to share here or what you think of as perfect to share here. Um, and there's no like one right answer to this. So I'm going to give you about a minute to answer in the chat or raise your hand and we'll have a little discussion on this one too. I don't see any hands raised yet. Any other examples? Another example might just be like on a hard drive and backed up somewhere else. Oh, and thank you for adding another um, example of a vendor. SoundCloud and Reclaim Hosting. Yeah, thanks for adding that example. And I didn't ask um, for access, it, how will you provide access, but um, many different options for that one too. We're not really talking about that so much. We're really focusing on the like getting it into digital format, but of course sharing it, part of that Sustainable Her Heritage Network for um, framework for digital preservation. Sharing it is important. I know um, Amelia uses Mukachu, who, there you go, it's in the chat. Um, so using Yimukuchi CMS for online access. Other people may use places like Internet Archive or um, your other local CMS that you're using. Great, Brett also adds multiple drives in multiple locations and keeping the original since you have the space. Thank you. So I want to point you to one more um, resource for digital preservation if you're looking for a place to get started. Um, so actually, this is how I first started working with Amelia was on developing this digital preservation assessment framework and in addition to that, a peer assessment framework. Um, and we did a workshop on this a while ago, I think it was 2018, um, in person. And some of you may have been there. It's hard to know without people's faces. I'm not as good as names as with faces. So if you were there, shout out. Um, and you might start with, if you weren't there, you might take a look at this resource for a peer assessment for digital preservation to get started, not just on the essential, like have another copy somewhere else, but on things like policy and long-term sustainability of your digital collections. So thinking a bit more holistically, this is one place to start in addition to the Sustainable Heritage Network digital stewardship curriculum, which if you want to learn more, really good place to start. Okay, so now I'm going to summarize, just give you like a few quick, if you take nothing else away, 
suggestions about what you might remember. And then we'll wrap up with a um, closing exercise on prioritizing next steps and time for questions as well. So to recap, some key takeaways that we've talked about. We talked about format ID and identifying formats as a first step in preservation physical deterioration and risk level is also going to be a part of digitization prioritization storing to prolong the life while working towards digitization as well we talked about storage best practices like flat or vertical and um, cool and dry conditions we talked about collections inventories to understand and quantify needs and challenges and using existing frameworks and resources for assessment. We talked about rehousing with discussion, a little debate around rehousing or not. And AV rehousing strategy is a little bit different from book or paper strategies, as we saw. And rehousing is only really necessary or useful in a few circumstances, like when an item is moldy, has no housing at all, or the housing is damaged beyond use. And then recapping what we just talked about, digitizing in-house or outsourcing, both routes are valid, whichever works best for your needs and your resources, considering both as well. Uh, outsourcing film, I didn't say that earlier, but usually you want to outsource film really hard to do in-house and likely outsource video audio is the easiest one to do in-house i would say we had a good chat about um, what factors you consider in selection for digitization people added some really good ones and the recommendation is to document what factors you consider and how you make decisions talked about guidelines for audio and visual video capture whatever guidelines you're using establish them based on best practices accounting for your local environment and document them use professional equipment for the best playback quality and experienced equipment operators only on the equipment follow best practices for sample rate and resolution um, as defined in the resources that i pointed to Lastly, digital preservation, it's not all or nothing. You can take steps towards better and better. You can follow the framework of get it, check it, save it, share it, and at the bare minimum, have a few copies, have one of them in a different place. So in closing, I want to take a few minutes now. If you have brainstormed some ideas for things that you could do to preserve your AV collections, Go ahead and um, take that list and start breaking it down into these three buckets of one thing you can do soon, one thing that will take more time, and one thing that you don't know how to start. And you can take that list and um, put it as a starting place to do some more diving into the resources that I've pointed to or ask some more questions. So. Again, if you've got a list of things that you could do as action items, take that list and prioritize them into these buckets on the second page or backside of the handout for today. So how are we gonna do that is I'm gonna set a timer for um, three minutes to give you a chance to do that. And then when that three minutes is up, we will discuss in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and start a timer now and you can work on prioritizing and if you didn't, write down any action items, you could do that now, or you could just like enjoy three minutes of quiet.
All right, it's been three minutes. So I hope you had a chance to think about it a little bit and maybe prioritize a thing or two. And so now I'd love to hear from some of you um, or all of you in the chat and some of you verbally if you want on, let's start with one thing you can do soon. What are your ideas for one thing you can do soon? Both to share and to just kind of give other people examples that they might also just snag from you. The two great examples of things you can do soon. We've got inventory, multiple backups. Yeah, this is a great reflection too of like the different places that different people or institutions are in the like ongoing life cycle of digitizing and preserving AV. Let's go to the next one. One thing that will take more time. I'm also realizing that I said list things and then in the column heading I said one thing so sorry a little bit of a mixed message there thanks for bearing with me. Uh, what is one thing that will take more time. Great example from Amelia that, yeah, applying for grant funding will totally take more time. And then keeping an eye on the time. Also, feel free to add one thing you don't know how to start. And either type it or raise your hand. Great examples of complicated decisions. And yeah, adding budget constraints and other priorities to this um, totally can put it in that bucket of things I don't know how to start or just a thing that will take more time too. Yeah, figuring out how to deaccession in a good way. And these might feel a little unresolved now because they probably are and may remain unresolved. So I just want to like validate that, yes, these are difficult things to start and will take, um, you know, conversations and decisions to get to a place. Thank you all. These are really great examples. I appreciate your sharing them with everybody in the group here. And I just want to to wrap up, say thank you again one more time. Um, I am happy to answer any questions that you have. And oh, another great resource in the chat. Happy to answer any questions that you have now, or please feel free to reach out to me at annie.peterson at lyricist.org if at any time later you have questions as well. Please don't hesitate to reach out anytime. Um, so thank you everybody for your participation, your input, 
all of your feedback and questions today. I really appreciate it. If you want to go ahead um, with the rest of your after your morning for you all, um, feel free to go ahead. Uh, but if you have any questions, please stick around and ask, and I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much. I appreciate that in the chat for you.